Hello and welcome to our Sunday morning sermon from Northumberland Heath Baptist Church. I'm Andrew White, the Associate Minister there, working alongside our Senior Pastor Steve Gordon. This is uh, Sunday the 21st of February and our theme runs and we're at Hearing from God number 8. And we're actually going to look at the issue of hearing from God when we are suffering or feeling God forsaken. But we're also at the start of Lent, so let us start in prayer. Father God, at the start of Lent, help us not to focus on what to give up when life is so restricted at present, but help us to focus on where we can find time to be closer to you. Help us to reflect that Jesus walked this earth and knows our sadness and our sufferings. Help us to be open to your spirit, even if we feel alone on life's journey. Ever present Jesus, may we journey to the cross, knowing that our salvation is found there. Amen. In our series, we are going to look at the book of Job from the Old Testament. The book of Job is part of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, and it's quite a challenge because Job seems to suffer with a lot of misfortune and struggles you need to understand that some of this is in a very poetic form. And the book deals with the idea of theodicy. Theodicy means, does God permit suffering? Where is God when we are struggling? Where is God when things seem so bleak? And so perhaps for us, the context is... What about when we feel God forsaken? What about when we have suffered significant problems or loss? So we're looking at the book of Job in the Old Testament. In chapters one and two, we learn that Job himself is blameless and upright. A sincere follower of his Lord God but he loses everything. His family, he then suffers with bodily sores and problems. He is belittled by others in the community and ultimately he desires to die. The book is very strange because in chapters one and two, we, we realize that this is part of a sort of heavenly debate where angels and Satan are challenging God about suffering. Satan, the accuser, says to God that perhaps an upright man would turn against God following attacks on his wealth, on his family, on his future, on his body, on his status and on his mind. And so we turn to one passage from Job, and we're going to look at Job chapter 3, verses 1 through to 11. Job 3, 1 to 11. After all this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Job said, let the day perish in which I was born and the night that said a man child is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it or light shine on it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds settle upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year, let it not come into the number of the months. Yes, 
Let that night be barren, let no joyful cry be heard in it. Let those curse it who curse the sea, those who are skilled to rouse up Leviathan. Let the stars of its dawn be dark, let it hope for light but have none. May it not see the eyelids of the morning, because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb and hide troubles from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth, come forth from the womb and expire? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Not the easiest of passages, I just chose one of those, but at least the scriptures in our word in the Old Testament are very real. Job cries out in his despair. He calls out that he wished he'd never been born. Job is distraught. And actually his mental health is such that he wishes he hadn't been born. He doesn't want to be here. But in all of that, Job doesn't curse God. Job doesn't turn away from God. He bemoans his lot. He struggles with his God forsakenness, with his suffering, but he doesn't curse God. The book of Job and his story is perhaps best known for three people often called Job's comforters. And they're no comfort whatsoever. Job's comforters in the book actually deflect Job's, Job's real grief. They deflect it in a wrong direction. He has every reason to grieve the loss of his family, his health, maybe even his status within the community. They're real griefs, but Job's comforters try and deflect him off in a wrong direction. Job has suffered, therefore he must have deserved it. And if he's deserved it, therefore he must be basically a wretched sinner. And for you and for me, when we are feeling low, we can go through those feelings too. We are suffering, Therefore, we must have deserved it. And we deserve it because we're wretched sinners. What's terrible, and this is an encouragement for you and for me if it's difficult times, is Job's comforters argue wrongly so that Job ends up focusing his real sadness onto God's wrath onto God's anger. And it's worth, worth remembering that, that the Satan, the evil one, is able to get into our minds and our emotions when we lose wealth, we lose family and those dear to us, we lose status and any sense of the future. There is a Roman Catholic writer called St John of the Cross and he wrote about the dark night of the soul. His view was that this was actually part of the journey through purgatory, a Roman Catholic idea of what we have to do after we die and perhaps we don't share that idea. But many other writers have used this idea, the dark night of the soul, to explore how we hear from, or at least stay connected with, God when things are desperate, when we are suffering, when we're confused. So amazingly, ultimately, Job holds firm to his trust in God, even when all the things in his mortal life seem so uncertain. 
In Job's struggles, mental, physical, the challenges of those people who would speak into his ear, he still trusts in a God, even though he doesn't understand what is going on. And so we read in Job chapter 5, verses 8 through to 15. As for me, I would seek God, and to God I would commit my cause. He does great things and unsearchable, marvellous things without number. He gives rain on the earth and sends waters on the fields. He sets on high those who are lowly and those who mourn are lifted to safety. He frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands have no success. He takes the wise in their own craftiness and the schemes of the wily are brought to a quick end. They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope at noonday as in the night. But he saves the needy from the sword of their mouth, from the hand of the mighty. How wonderful, even in the midst of difficulties and challenges, that Job is able to speak those words. They sound like some of the Psalms. The other thing that Job manages to do when we turn to chapter 19 is that Job, although he clearly is struggling, acknowledges he has the need for a redeemer. Someone to buy him back to a more certain future. And so in Job chapter 19, 25 and 26, we hear, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God. Quick change of scenery because I wanted to make use of a book. Our theme is hearing from God and this week it's hearing from God in suffering. I don't know whether you are struggling, whether you've lost someone dear, whether you feel God forsaken and it's a challenge as to whether or not we hear from God in those times. Perhaps if like Job we can just stay faithful to our trust in God, ultimately we might look back and realise we've learned something, something about ourselves during a difficult time. In closing, the darkest time in all of history was of course at the cross and the Roman centurion hears Jesus Christ himself cry out that he is God forsaken and one of my college lecturers John Colwell who suffers with significant mental health issues has written that God is in the suffering and the darkness that we might feel. And so if particularly you're struggling at this time of uncertainty or suffering or forsakenness, John himself in his book provides a closing prayer that takes us very much to the foot of the cross. Dear Lord, our lives are blighted by presuppositions about who you are, about what you can and cannot do, about where you are present and where you are absent. The story of Christ's cross obliterates our presuppositions. You can do what you have done. You are present even when everything seems to speak of your absence. Please give us the grace, like that centurion, to recognise you in the darkness and the contradictions, 
to discern your presence even in our own cries of forsakenness for the sake of him who was forsaken for us. Amen. Whatever you're doing, go with God and be safe.